whenever you're ready, Lily. You got it. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, um, thank you for taking the time today. And I want to welcome you to the District 4, which is the North Texas area conversation on the upcoming 87th legislature. I want to begin by thanking the Texans for the Arts board members in our area. And that is Dallas right now, Irving and Fort Worth, Augustine Arteaga, Symmetria Goodson, Chris Heinbaugh, Jennifer Scripps, Joanna St. Angelo, Clyde Valentine, Todd Eric Hawkins, Karen Wiley, Jenny Teig, and Kathy Neese Brown. And uh, these are movers and shakers that have offered their time to be on the board of Texans for the Arts. I also want to, I don't think she's on the call, but I want to recognize the chair of the board of directors for Texans for the Arts, and that's Cookie Ruiz. Executive Director of Ballet Austin, and she's the chair of the TFA Board of Directors. Each of you that are on this call that are individual members or organization members, we really couldn't do what we do without you. So I want to give a shout out to you as well. Um, TFA is a membership-based organization, and I can't say enough that this organization's advocacy work is not only impactful, it is essential for the survival of the arts in Texas. Some of you might be new to this organization, so I wanted to give you just a snapshot. Um, it is the official statewide advocacy organization that works to protect and increase and I'll say it again, increase public funding and to promote policy that supports the arts. TFA ensures that the arts are an ongoing part of the public dialogue and that your voices today are heard. We are so fortunate to have a leader like Anne Graham who was recently awarded the State Advocacy Award from Americans for the Arts. She is also the chair of the at the national level of the State Arts Action Network. Both Anne Graham and Chris Kiley make a powerful leadership duo for Texans for the Arts. This dialogue today is important as TFA prepares for the 87th legislature. Today, Anne Graham and the TFA staff will discuss the goals of the upcoming agenda. And it is the perfect segue to introduce Shannon Gungardi, who will give an overview of the TFA legislative agenda. Um, take off your hats, open your brains, because Shannon will give you, uh, really set this meeting off and will explode with information. Shannon, thank you, take it away. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate you all being on the call today. and. I thought I would start by just giving um, a little bit of basic information about the legislative session that is around the corner. Things are starting to gear up already, so this is great timing to start the conversation. Um, the legislature in Texas meets every odd number year for 140 days. And so per the Texas Constitution, we're about to start our next legislative session. Uh, we'll start on January the 12th of 2021 and we'll go until May 31st um, of, of 2021, after which the governor has 20 days after session ends to uh, veto any bills that he might want to veto. And then in September of 2021 is when the next kind of cycle begins. And so most of the bills that pass during the legislative session will become effective in September and the budget that's going to be written will start September 1st of 2021. So it just kind of outlines the, the session. The governor can call a special session if they haven't finished the budget, if they're still working on certain issues that he deems are priorities. And those usually, not usually, they can't run for longer than 30 days. So they'll run usually during the summertime. If they haven't passed the budget, you'll have a couple of special sessions. If a budget's not passed by August 31st, then that's when you see you know, government shut down. I don't think we'll get there, but that's, that's what happens. Um, so just to set the stage for the session, we had, um, as you all are very aware, an election uh, recently. There's been a lot of attention to the federal election. That's still going on apparently, but the Texas legislature also uh, had a series of elections. And so the House of Representatives has 150 members. 
They all serve for two year terms. So they're up for election every cycle. And there was a lot of talk this last cycle that um, currently the, the House was Republican majority. They had 83 Republican seats compared to 67 Democrats. And there was a widespread belief that the Democrats would either get very, very close to a 75-75 split or they would take over the House. There's a lot of money spent in Texas on these campaigns. And when the day was over and all the money was spent and votes were counted, um, the Texas House is exactly where they were before, 83 Republicans to 67 Democrats. One Republican incumbent lost to a Democrat and one incumbent Democrat lost to a Republican. So there was basically a swap and here we are. And so with a Republican House, there's also um, a conversation on who will be the Speaker of the House. And so Dennis Bonin is the current Speaker. He announced in 2019 that he would not be rerunning for that position. And so that position will be elected at the beginning of session. Dade Phelan is a representative from the Beaumont area. He's, he began serving in the House in 2015. He is the presumptive uh, Speaker. He has secured enough pledges from sitting members and members that are coming into the house and has announced that he has enough votes. And so the, the, the presumption that we're all operating under is that come January, he will be elected the new speaker. In the Senate side, the Senate was a Republican majority before the election. There are 31 senators. They serve for four year terms and they rotate who's typically up for election. The, uh, Republicans lost one seat. Senator Flores out of the San Antonio area, Republican, lost to um, a Democrat representative, or I'm sorry, uh, Roland Gutierrez took over that seat. So now you have 18 Republicans and 13 Democrats in the Texas Senate. They're um, typically to bring up a bill on the Senate floor. A couple of sessions ago, it took 21 votes. And so the Senate really works in a bipartisan manner to say, You've got to get you know, two thirds of the members to be okay with whatever bill is going to come forward. That was changed um, to a three fifth vote. Uh, last session of the session before, only requiring 19 members to bring up a bill. Now that the Republicans only have 18 members, there is a rumor that the uh, Lieutenant Governor might push to change, I shouldn't say a rumor, I think he may have even said this, but to change the vote to a simple majority. And so that would make, um, you know, the 18 Republicans have the ability to bring up legislation. And so just kind of watch for the politicalization um, or, you know, politics coming into play. Also, uh, redistricting is going to be a big issue next session. The uh, census, as you all know, has ended. Every 10 years, states are required to redraw their lines. And so that's going to be happening this legislative cycle. And once those new districts are drawn, every state senator will have to rerun for their seat because they will be new districts. And so as we had this time where all 150 House members were up, next cycle, all 150 House members, all 31 Republicans, the governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, comptroller are all up for re-election. So we'll see how politics plays into this session, but they're all gonna be up for, for re-election. Um, another major issue that we're going to get into a little bit more today is the budget. And so the only bill that technically has to pass each legislative session is the budget. When we left the session in 2019, the comptroller takes the budget, he certifies it to say we have enough money to pay for it, and then he tells you what you're likely going to have in the bank after you've paid for all the obligations in the budget. And at the end of last session, we were all very excited to learn that we had $3 billion that would be left in the bank at the end of the biennium once all was said and done. And then COVID happened. And in July of this year, the comptor came back out and readjusted his estimate and said, okay, instead of having a $3 billion surplus, we are going to have a $4.5 billion deficit. So that's, you know, obviously in the wrong direction um, due to not only COVID, but also some you know, major issues we've been having with oil prices, as you may have seen. And so because of those two issues kind of compounding, that's where he left us um, in July. He has since said that um, we're, we're trending a little bit above where we thought we would be in July. So it may not be 4.5, it may be more along the lines of 3.5, but regardless, we are going into next session anticipating it being a tight budget 
There has been an influx of federal funds. You've probably heard of the CARES Act, Coronavirus Relief Fund. There was $6 billion specifically earmarked for the states. Another 1.8 for small cities and counties that if they don't spend the 1.8, that goes back to the state. So the state really is looking at about $8 billion. About 3 billion has been spent so far. There's another 5 billion left, but the legislature will very likely try to repurpose those funds in a way to reduce the 3.5 or 4.5 shortfall, which is a good thing because, you know, if you if you can get a handle on the shortfall and you get into next legislative session, you can hopefully maintain all the promises that you've made. They made a, a huge commitment to education last session, healthcare, you know, some of the things that we're going to talk about that we pushed for and got in the budget. And so if we can get a handle on the shortfall, it makes it a little bit easier to, to continue to pay for your commitments that were made last session. Um, and so what are kind of, what, what are the Texans for the Arts legislative agenda and how does that fit into what I just talked about? So the first item that, you know, overarching theme of our legislative agenda is to protect, protect all of the um, things that we were able to achieve last session. So last session, we were able to get $10 million put into the Texas Commission on the Arts budget for grants to cultural districts. That money um, has flown, has, flown, has, has you know, been, been used, um, I don't know what word I'm trying to say. Um, in FY 20 and 21, that money went out the door. It's been given to the recipients. And in fact, some of the money for FY 21 was able to be repurposed um, to help you know, some of the folks that were dealing with COVID issues. But we really want to uh, push within the legislature and advocate that that 10 million continues to stay in the budget and is appropriated for FY22 and 23. So protecting this, that $10 million. Um, we wanna protect hotel occupancy tax. Ian's gonna talk more about that in a minute. Um, we, we wanna protect any statutory changes that potentially could erode at the percent allowed for the arts. We wanna work with local communities to push you know, local communities to maximize the hotel occupancy tax. Hotel taxes have taken a big hit as you all can imagine, because of COVID, some of the numbers were just really astonishing, especially in the beginning. And so that revenue base is not going to be as substantial. And so we wanna make sure the legislature understands that that revenue stream isn't going to, to do all the things that it had done in the past. There was $250,000 also that we fought for um, at the Texas Commission on the Arts for veterans, military art grants, um, kind of arts healing, the, and you say it better than I do. What is it? The healing power of the arts, or she's got a real great way to explain it. But we were able to get two hundred fifty thousand dollars in TCA's budget, and so we're going to work really hard that that money is maintained in the base budget that's going to come out in January. Um, and so, you know, like I said, protect the funding that we got in last session. I will also note that we've been working with the uh, governor, lieutenant governor, speaker, the budget writers on a proposal trying to get. Uh, about $9.5 million in relief for art uh, groups that have been disproportionately impacted due to COVID. We understand that the arts were disproportionately impacted and a lot of you on this call can probably speak firsthand to that. Some of the first really entities to be, to be shut down, we think that will be some of the last entities to fully be back up and running. And we have made that um, you know, pitch to the legislature Right now, the types of things that they're using, um, our, our pitch was to use the coronavirus relief fund for some grant programs. What we're being told and what we understand is that so far the coronavirus relief fund money is really going towards um, trying to help get a handle on the shortfall. What are things that we're spending money on that we have to because of COVID and can we reimburse for that as opposed to creating a new, a new program or a new grant. So we're still hopeful. We're still keeping our, you know, our, our proposal on the table. The money has to be out the door by the end of this calendar year. And we're competing with a lot of very significant needs that the state has. So we'll keep making our case. Um, and part, partly we wanna make our case to go back to that protect, right? We wanna make sure they understand that arts have been impacted. So if you're not able to do an additional 9.5, at the very least, don't go in and cut the 10 million that you've provided. So. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne, and so she can kind of clean up what I might have missed or, or misspoken about. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Shannon, for the overview. Really appreciate it. And I think the couple of important things to think about, like where do all these asks fit into? The $9.5 million, again, that is not part of the legislative session. That chunk of money was the CARES money. And I think Shannon earlier, was it earlier today, um, was mentioning there's, that of the $8 billion that came to the state, there's still about $5 billion that has not been distributed. And correct me if I'm wrong with that figure. And these funds have to be distributed uh, by December 31st, 2020. So the last thing we want is for Texas to have to send any money back to the federal government. So, um, and again, our $9.5 million is a tiny little piece of uh, $5 billion. So as we said, we're, we've still got this, um, this request. The request came formally from the Texas Commission on the Arts. It has to come from the agency, but we worked with them to, to draft the language. And so we'll just keep, we'll keep on that. Um, I think in terms of the session, the things that are important to highlight are, um, again, we have our two primary things, protecting the Texas Commission on the Arts and protecting the chapter 351, the hotel municipal hotel occupancy tax tax code. What's important to think about both of those are the, it, it's, it's healthy in this funding ecosystem, this public funding ecosystem to have something that's a tax um, a tax by anybody who comes in and spends their night in a hotel or an Airbnb or any overnight stay um, versus an appropriation. They're two different processes um, to change chapter 351. You got to file a bill. Um, communities do it. There are, I think last year there were at least 30 bills that were filed to change and modify chapter 351. We work with the Texas Hotel Lodging Association and we really wanna monitor that and make sure that none of those bills um, would impact either the, the fundamental aspect of the 7% um, municipal hotel occupancy tax and or as San, uh, Shannon referenced, um, not to meddle with the up to 15% up to for the arts. Let me jump back just a little bit to the TCA. So the TCA, again, this last year, there, the biennial budget was, was closer to 24 million. When we first started our advocacy work a couple sessions ago, it was around six. So we have really worked hard with all of you and almost everybody on this call probably receives TCA grant funding. You may be part of the cultural district. Um, in fact, in North Texas here, there are seven or eight. There is Denton, McKinney, Arlington, Fort Worth, Fort Worth Southside, which is a new one this year, Plano, Dallas, and then Dallas is Deep Ellum, which is another new one this year. So a cultural district, as you know, for those of you who are in Dallas, it's a, a geographically defined area with a vibrant, dynamic, rich combination of arts and culture sector industries of retail, of restaurants and bars and things to do and festivals and places to see and be. Um, and you've got the perfect model here. And then you've got little tiny ones like Canadian Texas and North Texas with population 2000 or San El uh, Elizario near um, El Paso, which is a tinier town all the way up to you know Dallas. And Dallas now with two, Houston added two more and now has six cultural districts. Austin now has two. It's not a competition for them, but it's really an opportunity to develop these uh, cultural resources that become uh, magnets for tourism, magnets for economic development, uh, social opportunity to interact, and a sort of cultural identity. And they're, again, really magnets for tourism, which feeds the, the tourism industry is what feeds the hotel tax. And it actually also is one of the requirements for cultural district grant, grant programming. And the TCA also has many other programs. They have their touring roster, they have arts uh, create, which is their uh, operational support, and they have Arts Respond. Arts Respond under um, the healthcare one is where the arts and the military funding is. And then the other in Arts Respond, they have education, justice, tourism, healthcare, and then agriculture and rural. So they have these five sort of pillars that they fund. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if almost everybody here doesn't get some of those TCA grants. Um, so let me jump to the hotel occupancy tax. So the, the original, there's a tax, the 6% tax is the state tax that goes straight up to the, to the legislature, to the governor's office. That's what funds the travel and tourism office, the music office, the film office, and other projects of the governor. Um, the 7% municipal tax goes straight to your city. Every quarter, those hotels are required by law or overnight stays are required by law to send that money to your municipality. The municipality gets to, uh, gets to decide on how those funds will be distributed. What is the delegated authority? What, and then the delegated authority gets to decide on grant programs, et cetera. 
Before we jump into this, um, just because it's it's a complicated tax law, but it's really important for everybody to understand how it works. We have a video and we're gonna share that with you and then I'll go on just a wee bit longer about that. Chris, do you wanna show the video? Thank you, and if that, I hope that piques your interest and to go into the website itself, www.hottoolkit.com, and you can actually navigate your way through the site, and we encourage you to do so. And we really talk about it being a dynamic website to ensure that we answer people's questions as they come up, or if they have case studies that they want to submit, ideas of good, good models, et cetera, to use. So um, we just launched that in October. It is out there in the world and we hope becomes a, a tool that you will use a lot and in communities large and small across the state. Um, one quick thing on the hotel tax, the, the original taxes were started in the 1960s and it wasn't until 1977 that the arts was added. And the arts were added, this was even pre-urban myth of Boeing and coming to Dallas or not coming to Dallas. But in 1977, the Texas legislature realized that the arts were an important component to the economic development of their communities. And they felt that uh, there was a dearth of arts organizations and investment and that um, the arts should be added to that to help attract businesses and to help attract employees who wanted to live, raise their families, work, et cetera, in, um, in our communities. So it's been part of the law ever since uh, 1977. And it's one of the so-called nine allowable uses, the others focusing around tourism, conventions, CVBs, marketing, signage, and then for some states or for some communities, beaches and, and sports facilities. Um, our goal is to have every community in the state of Texas maximize the full 15% um, for the arts. And that's one of the, the goals of the tool. Um, last but not least, we passed a bill two sessions ago called Senate Bill 1221, 
which is a reporting bill and a transparency bill. And um, the comptroller publishes in January to February a request for municipalities to submit all of their information around how much hotel tax they collected and how much they distributed for the five largest allowable uses. One of those is the arts. And that information is on our website. It's also on the comptroller's website. And you can look up your city and find out exactly how much they collect. As Lily said, the um, hotel tax, uh, Lily and um, Shannon said, the, the demise of the hotel tax was between 92 and about 58%. I think in Austin, it was 92% down for that, the second and the third quarter now of the, of the state of this year. So for those of you who do receive some hotel occupancy tax money, you'll know that it's been cut. Um, and what we just wanna be at the table as, as tourism and travel does rebound, we wanna be at the table to ensure that um, when the CVBs and the uh, conventions and the hotels are coming together, that the arts are up there at the same platform as important to help rebuild our cities after the pandemic. Um, we wondered when we first came out with this, whether or not it was gonna be timely and whether or not we needed to sort of sit on the toolkit for a while, but we realized that actually this helps us raise the playing field that we and the prominence prominent role that we play in helping re rebuild our communities. So that's a, a quick tour of that. Um, I was going to turn this over back over to Chris Kiley, who's going to facilitate to see whether or not y'all have